If I don't know you yet, my name is David, and I have the privilege, I'm good there, but thank you. I have the privilege of serving both churches, Esperanza Church as a pastor, and right here at Lake Springs Church as a worship director, and I rejoice every time. I see that we're taking steps, steps that are intentional, as steps that may make us uncomfortable, but steps that nonetheless reflect the heart of the gospel and what the gospel came to accomplish, which is to bring people from all nations into one people, to make the people that were separated at one point by a nation, by a flag, by an ideology, to be together as one, and not just be together in a place, but actually be one, destined for a life full of the presence of God one day and here, right here on earth, while we await his coming. Thank you, Derek. We are the Capital C Church, and it is represented so beautifully, beautifully here. And today it is my honor to bring the Word of God to you today and to point our attention to the Bible's primary focus and the primary thing that God wants us to know about Him. The essential thing about Him that He wants everybody to know, and that is that God is love. That God is love, and by His Holy Spirit, He's calling us as well to become the people of love that He has created us to be. Because at the end of the day, all we need is love. Turn to somebody and say, all you need is love. All you need is love. All you need is love. Amen. Amen. And love is all we need. Amen. And really what we're saying when we say that is that all we need is God. Because the Bible tells us that God is love. And the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, loves proclaiming about who he is. And in Exodus 34, we read that he is a God full of compassion and mercy. That he is slow to anger. And he is filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. And that is the God that we serve. And that is the kind of giving and life-sustaining love that is available and that all humans need to thrive. Not just to exist, but to thrive and to flourish in this world. But this compassionate, merciful, slow to anger, full of unfailing love and, and faithfulness, God did not content himself with just saying those things and putting those things in writing. No, he became like us to show us his true nature. And in John 1, we find that the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. You see something repeated there, unfailing love and faithfulness. It is the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and, Asia, and Jacob that 2,000 years ago became a human being. And we saw the glory of God reflected in the person of Jesus, the God of all creation becoming flesh, and becoming human for 33 years. And he walked with us and he showed us the love that is compassionate, that is merciful, that is unfailing, that is completely faithful. And for three beautiful years, we read in the Gospels that he invited people into a relational community. And he went around uh, the, the villages and towns of his town in the Middle East, proclaiming a new kingdom that was arrived, that had arrived with his coming. The kingdom not of this world, but a kingdom for this world. A kingdom built on the foundation of him as a person on his words, and therefore built on the foundation of love. On the foundation of love. And then, 40 days after Jesus ascended into heaven, after having shown us what sacrificial love is on the cross and having been raised from the dead by the Holy Spirit's power, he descended in the form of the Holy Spirit into 120 people that were gathered in a holy place. And they were clamoring for the presence of God to empower them to go out and announce this new kingdom. And the Holy Spirit did just that. He indwelled in them, in those 120 people, and from that moment on, there came an explosion of announcing the kingdom of heaven, of announcing that God made love, had come to make new human beings out of all of humanity, out of all people, one people, under his name, under his kingdom, under his banner, under his authority. And he gave us two things. He gave us one commandment, 
the commandment to love each other as he had loved us. And he also gave us a mission that is fueled by that commandment, and that mission is to announce that the kingdom of heaven is near to all of us who are ready and willing to come into the authority of Jesus and to proclaim him, him as our Lord and Savior. So, today, as we get ready for a Labor Day tomorrow, I know if you're excited about that. I know you are. I want to announce to us and remind us of the main labor of all who call themselves believers in Jesus, all who have come under the authority of Jesus. And it is a word that if we commit to this word, that we commit to live within the, the amplitude and the magnitude and the depth of this word, that we are capable of being ignited into the same explosion of advancement of the kingdom of heaven of the New Testament. Because the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the same Holy Spirit that came upon those 120 people and then they went and announced the kingdom of heaven all throughout the Middle East and that, that Holy Spirit that empowered people to bring the gospel all the way here to North Carolina, the other side of the world and to all Latin America and to all the world. The same Holy Spirit is alive and present right here with us, indwelling in us and he wants us to be the church and the people he has called us to be. And all that we need for that to happen, all that we need for that to happen is, yeah, you guessed it, all we need is love. So please turn into your Bibles to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. Book of Ephesians chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible, the words will be on the screen. And uh, in his letter to Ephesians, to the Ephesians, in beautifully crafted prose, Paul is going to show us how to live in a way that reflects the kind of love that it is the essence of God's character. And the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. A loyal love and a sacrificial love. So as he closes chapter 4 and begins chapter 5, Paul writes this. He says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. I love that. And walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So Paul is encouraging us to walk in the same steps that Jesus walked, in kindness, compassion, mercy, slow to anger, to be full of love, full of faithfulness. And how did he love us? He gave himself up for us. He willingly gave himself so that he could be the atonement sacrifice for our sin and for the death that we deserved. And that became a fragrant, fragrant offering to God, a fragrant offering to his presence. What became that? It was that giving oneself up for the good of others giving of oneself for the good of others. That is what pleases God. That is what flows into his presence as a fragrant sacrifice, an offering. And why is that? Because loving others and giving oneself for the good of others is the ultimate sign of the new creation that Jesus came to bring. And it is the evidence that the kingdom of heaven has arrived in us, a kingdom that has already arrived, but not yet fully. A kingdom that is here, but not yet expressed completely. So to understand this, and I'm going to go into this very topic right now, I want to explore before we go farther in reading one of Paul's central themes in this letter to the Ephesians. Because throughout this letter, Paul is giving us an insight into the world and the times that we live in. The world and the times that we live in. I had a fascinating conversation with my wife, Vasti, who's who was singing a, a few minutes here. I don't see her, but she's so amazing, right? So she was singing, and, and, and she always brings up uh, some conversations that are, you know, just out of blue, like really deep. And so he, she started telling me that to be born in the time that we are, it is so important that we know and are aware of the challenges that we have to face. Because if we fail to be aware of them, we won't rise to them. 
And we need, as believers, to be aware of the time and the challenges that we have in order for us to together rise to the occasion, to be knowingly and intentionally addressing the challenges that we have, because this will help us understand the world around us and our role in it as believers in a better way. So I'm going to share with you this graphic here, and we're going to go into this Paul's central theme, theme for the book of Ephesians. So the circle here to the left, and Spanish is over on the top. The circle to the left here is what G, uh, Jesus and late, later Paul calls this age. This is the age that everything from creation up until now has in it. This is the age that we live in. And this age is characterized by evil and sin. It's characterized by death. All of us will one day die if Jesus doesn't come before. It's characterized by slavery, not just to one another, but to other things that slave us into sin and into other evil things. Into, it's characterized by violence. It's characterized by a curse of being separated from God by our sin. So that is this age. And then here to the right, we have the age to come. The age that Jesus' life brought about, so Jesus' life and, and, and his walking with us and his resurrection uh, brought, but that is not fully arrived until Jesus returns again and he brings his kingdom fully into this earth. So this new age to come is characterized by justice and love, life, freedom, shalom, which means a, a beautiful peace and in the integrity of the kingdom of heaven here on earth, and then blessing. That is the, those are the characteristics of the age to come, and they're completely opposite of the age that is now. The life and death and resurrection of Jesus inaugurated an age to come, but that it is not here yet, that will not come to fruition fully it will not be consummated until Jesus returns, comes back to this earth to bring his kingdom fully. And this time, the time that you and I live in today is right here. In Christ, those of us who have decided to be one with him, to be under his authority, to be part of his new kingdom, we live in a time that it is part of this age and part of the age to come. We live on earth, but we actually live heaven on earth, and we are living in Christ in a new time frame, a time that is redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, and he is inviting us to have our role in this time with him of announcing his kingdom to the world. And if you're confused a little bit, that's okay, you can come after, and I'll be able to explain it in more detail. But the question is, if we live in this time, if we live with the age that is now full of all of these things, and if we also live because of what Jesus did, if we, because of his blood restoring us into his family, also in the age to come, if we live in this transitional time, then how do we imitate while living in this time, Jesus' love in practical, tangible ways in this time between the ages, as we await Jesus' return. And I know that uh, maybe people on that side didn't see it. There it is. All right, so how do we love like Jesus loved in this age? All right, so let's go to Ephesians 5, now verse 15. Verse 15. And Paul is going to tell us exactly how we ought to live. So he says, be very careful then how you live. How do we imitate God's love in this world? The, in the being careful how we live. We have to be careful how we live. If we want to bring heaven to earth in this time, we must be intentional in imitating God, God's ways of living. We must imitate God's love by living like Jesus lived. But if I'm honest, and if you're honest, living like Jesus is not something that comes naturally to us in this age, right? Our flesh is full of these things still. And our flesh is telling us, no, I don't want this age. I want this age. I don't want the age to come. I want the age that is now. So Paul is going to tell us and break it down for us. 
And he's going to contrast four ways of living to help us understand how we have to be intentional in order to rise to the challenge of this age by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, let's keep reading. Be careful then how you live. He says, first, not as unwise, but as, you can say it, wise. Number two, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Then, verse 17, therefore, three, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And number four, do not get what? Drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with what? With the Holy Spirit. With the Holy Spirit. So, let's look at the first wave uh, that we are called to be wise and to, I mean, to imitate the love of God. First and foremost is not to live an unwise life, but a wise life. So, what is wisdom? Wisdom, according to the scriptures, is to live as God tells us to live, not as we think is best to live. And in a world where individualism and doing what is the best for you and what you feel is good is the rule, then that might be a very contradictory thing to practice. But wisdom is really practicing what we already know that God has said. Let's think about about a small child, for example. A small child uh, doesn't know a lot of stuff, but a small child is told certain things, right? For example, do not put your fingers in the electrical outlets. My mom has told me that I love to do that when I was a baby. Very dangerous. Don't do that. A small child is, co- is, is told, do wash your hands after going to the bathroom. And we raise them up and we enjoy seeing how they learn how to do that. We tell them, do look both ways before you cross the street. Especially if you grew up in Mexico or in Latin America. Now, what's the wise thing to do? That's right to follow those things that the child knows, right? She doesn't know all of this. She might not understand electricity. She might not understand microbes or how physics work. But if that child is able to practice what she knows, what she's been told by her parents, she is wisely wisely avoiding harm to herself, bringing the good to herself. In the same way, notice that Paul calls those who have decided to live by faith in Jesus children. He says that we are children. We are to live like children. We are not expected to know everything, but we are expected to do what we have been told. What we have been told. It is a wise living to put in practice what we do know. So in the context of our timeline here, what does that mean? It means that uh, we know enough to be wise in this time. We know enough to follow God's ways. And what's more, we don't have to know everything. We don't have to know all the mysteries of God to know what he has said. And what has he said? He has said, do to others what you would have them do to you. We know that much, right? So what we know, and putting into practice what we know, is wisdom. We're not expected to know everything, but he has shown us how Jesus lived. And so if we practice prayer, we are being wise because we know prayer is good. If we practice solitude, being alone with God and spending time with Him, we know that's good, we are wise. If we practice Sabbath, if we stop every six days, we stop for a day, we are being wise. If we practice generosity, we are being wise because we know what Jesus has said to us. Second, Paul says in verse 16 that we reflect the love of Jesus when we live making the most of every opportunity. Now, most of us read this and think carpe diem, right? That's Latin for what? Seize the day. Yes, seize the day. Make the most of your time. That's not bad. That's not a bad thing to do. My mom told me that growing up all the time. Redeem, I mean, uh, carpe diem, seize the day, get up, do it. But Paul's meaning is way deeper, way deeper. In reality, uh, in the original Greek, the phrase that Paul is using is to redeem the time. Now, redeeming is not a word that we use very often, but the word redeem is a biblical word that simply means or was used to denote when one went to the market and bought the freedom of a person who was enslaved. And so redeem means to buy back, to set free. To buy back, to set free. Now, in the context, again, of our timeline here, what is happening, what Paul is saying is that he's encouraging us to buy back time. Meaning, 
If these are the things that we could be practicing in this age, when we instead choose to practice these things, justice, love, life, freedom, blessing, then we are buying back time from the age to come and bringing it to the now. In other words, again, we're bringing heaven to earth. So to redeem the time is to completely think about our purpose in life completely in a new way. We're not here to have an amazing career and to have a lot of stuff and to have uh, the best vacations, but we're here for this purpose, to redeem time for justice, love, life, freedom. All those things are not bad, but they are a consequence of the goodness of God and not the purpose of a person who is redeemed to redeem the time. Now, What do you do uh, with, in your home? I, I, I drive here around Holy Springs, like the houses are beautiful, you know, the lawns are well kept, and then if I go into your house, I'm sure you've made it a very Eden-like place. You take the care to decorate it by seasons, it smells awesome, like it's just beautiful. You're making it an Eden-like place. Well, if we are to make the world a more Eden-like place, we must also redeem the time, just like you do that to Take away the time that you could be resting, you could be going here and there and decorate and keep your house. All right, so we understand that. Let's, go, let's still go on, verse 17. He says, how we ought to live. He says, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And that is why I did this graphic here. I wrestled with doing it or not, it might be too much, I don't know. But the reason I did this is because if we don't understand where we live, then we are living a foolish life, meaning an ignorant life. If we are going to rise to the challenges of today, we need to know that this is what's happened. With Jesus, a new time has come, a new time that is between ages, but that God wants to use us to bring heaven to earth. And that is the the challenge of all of those of us who have decided to follow him. We get to bring heaven to earth. And that is something that we can only do if we're full of the Holy Spirit's love. So will will we be foolish and just ignore all of this and live like the people in this age without this knowledge, without Christ live? Because the truth is a lot of us may come to church, but we are maybe not actually practicing these things. We're not practicing wisdom. We're not redeeming the time. We're just doing what everybody else does in this age and coming to church. But what we actually are called into is to live in a new time with a new wisdom, with a new heart for living. Finally, and this might be the most important, he says, get, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with who? With the Holy Spirit. So let's start with that metaphor. What does alcohol do to a human being? It inhibits our ability to tell right from wrong, right? It clouds our minds to reality and numbs our hearts to our own feelings. It masks our true state of life for an impaired fantasy version of it. What does the Spirit of God do to us? It's exactly the opposite. He empowers our ability to tell right from wrong. He centers our minds to the understanding of a true reality, this true reality, of what we have been called to to do and to be. He opens our hearts to our own feelings and our own brokenness so, so that we can bring that to the light of God and be healed. And so we can empathize with others and enter into their own pain because we have entered into ours. The Holy Spirit reveals the true identity that we have now and we can be transformed into people that are in Christ reflecting his love because we are being filled by the Holy Spirit. And that is what Paul is using to tell us you need to be filled by these things with the Holy Spirit. Be filled by the Spirit. And in the original Greek, again, he's saying something kind of weird to us. He's saying, be being filled. We never say that, right? Be being filled. But that is the actual phrase in Greek. Be being filled. What does this mean? That it is something constant. That it is something that happens every day. Be being continually, constantly doing what helps you to 
Come under the influence of the Holy Spirit so that he empowers you to live in this age as Christ lived on this earth. So, we live like Jesus by being filled by the Holy Spirit. And because we live in this age, in between ages, we have a choice between to, we have a choice into who we let influence us. Because there is no neutral ground here. Either you are letting the Holy Spirit influence you to live a life for justice and love and life and freedom, or you're just being passive and therefore you're letting the spirit of this age, the world, and entertainment dictate how you live and what you're influenced by. So, to be being filled by the Spirit of God is what empowers us to live a, a, a life full of the things that Jesus taught us to do, to imitate him as dearly beloved children. And let me be clear uh, on this. Yes, the Holy, Holy Spirit lives in every person who has decided to give themselves to his authority, but we are not merely filled with him, we are filled by him with the love of Jesus. So the question that I want to ask now is how then are we filled by the Spirit day to day in order to then live a life full of the love of Jesus? So if being filled by the Spirit is the thing that empowers us to live wisely, to redeem the time, and to know the time that we live in in order to live a life that is pleasing to God, then how do we get filled by the Holy Spirit of these things? So let's keep reading because Paul answers that verse 19. He says, speaking to one another with psalms, this is how we are be being filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Holy Spirit, two, sing, singing and making music from the heart to the Lord, three, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and fourth, submitting to one another in reverence to Christ. So speaking, singing, giving thanks, and Submitting, And I want to end with submitting. That's, that's where we're headed. In order to be filled by the Spirit of God with the kind of life that is full of His love, the love of Jesus, Paul first tells us that our speech matters. What, how we speak is really important in order to be filled by the Holy Spirit or be filled by the Spirit of this age. The more you experience how God speaks to you, and how he loves you, and that's why he mentions Psalms, the, spirit, the, the biblical poetry of the Bible, right? He mentions hymns, he mentions spiritual songs. All of these songs that we sang today are telling us of the way that God wants us to speak to him, wants us to speak to one another. And the more we are em enveloped by that influence, the more we begin to have that same language, because words matter. Right, married man? <laughs> Words matter. Language matters. A good communication or lack thereof is a sure way to either destroy a relationship or build it up. Language is so important. So that's why Paul is starting with this. I had to go through a whole uh, process of changing my language, say, changing the ways I speak, because for me... It is so easy to use language that is, that is more geared towards solving problems. So I'm a problem solver. So to use language to just get it done right now, like this, let's do it. And that is not a good thing, especially if you're married, and also especially if you're a leader in a church. That is not good language. I had to go through counseling. I had to go to uh, different courses that I found that God has been helping me to start speaking in a way that reflects the love that God has for me. And instead of gearing myself to speak in a way, to, we have to accomplish this, to start speaking in a way that strengthens my relationships with other people. I'm putting that first. Speaking is the first way in which we are filled by the Spirit to then communicate the love of Jesus, right? Some people uh, think that those things are separate. They're not. How you communicate to others 
really reflects and helps you to come under the influence of the Holy Spirit. That is singing. Singing. How do we love singing, right? But in our culture here in the U.S., singing is not really something that we do a lot. Like, we, you don't stand up and just, you know, uh, get up and start doing a musical to your family, right? That doesn't happen. Uh, unless you're into karaoke or you go to a stadium, singing is not part of everyday culture. And yet, Paul reminds us that singing is part of the culture of heaven. It's part of the culture of the age uh, to come. And when we make music with our heart to the Lord, when we hear ourselves say the truths of who God is with our mouths, and when we do it together, we are reminding our hearts, our inner being, of the truth of God's love. All right, next, we're encouraged to give thanks to the Lord in everything because gratefulness is a key way to be being filled by the Holy Spirit. Now, have you noticed that very often those who have least are those who give the most? Have you noticed that? I have a theory on that. I think people who have the least and give the most do so, and they give generously because they know where their provision comes from. Because they're depending every day on the one who's going to give them something for their sustenance. And therefore, they're quick to give to others from what they've been given. So when you and I recognize that, although we live here in the U.S. and there's abundance, when we recognize that all we have did not come from our own efforts, our hard work, our intelligence, our ancestry, or whatever, but that it came from God, starting with our very breath, then we are more equipped to be generous in our giving, right? This age tells us, no, you gain that because of what you studied, because what you work hard, because what, that is not what people in Christ believe. People in Christ believe that we have everything that we have because God is good all the time, all the time. And finally, this is a crucially radical and relevant to all followers of Jesus. If we are to be filled by the Spirit continually, we have to submit to one another out of reverence for the Messiah, for Christ. Now in your Bible, this verse, verse 21, might be under a different subheading, but actually in Greek it's a whole one continuous sentence from verses 18 to 24. There's no subheading. So what I want you to see is that to be being filled by the Holy Spirit requ requires the kind of living that announces the age to come to people. And we cannot say that we're announcing the age to come to people if we're not submitting to one another. We can be doing events. We can have the best band in the world. We can have the best light show in the world. We can have the best teaching, teacher in the world. But if we're not submitting to one another, we ha cannot announce the age to come to people like Jesus did. So, submission, what is submission? Submission is to place oneself under another. And Paul is saying that we become a person of love by practicing submission to one another. Now, I was raised in Mexico City, so my parents are Peruvian, but I lived there till I was 15. And in Mexico City, when you're raised, you are told to say, to respond to your name by one word. You say, Monday. Monday. That's how, that's how they raise it. And, and it's so intense. Oh, and by the way, that means command me. Yeah, command me. So that's how you respond when they call your name. Adults call your name. You say, Mande, command me. And if you don't say that, if you say what, you get reminded very quickly that that is not how you speak. <laughs> We're taught to respond by literally saying, command me. And that is the kind of submission that God is calling us towards. And I know it's intense, right? It's intense to say to somebody, command me. That's completely counter to this age. But Paul, Paul culminates his description of a life filled by the Spirit with the love of Jesus by telling us the same thing he told the Galatians. He said, serve one another humbly in love. Now this word serve is the same word in Greek for being a slave. Yeah. Yeah. Other English translations of the same verse say, through love, become slaves to one another. This is the ultimate way in which the Spirit of God fills us to live a life full of the love of Jesus. Where the approach to each other is not thinking what we can get from this person, what we can get from one another, but 
from a place of wanting to serve and to love, through love, we become a slave saying to others, command me, I'm ready to serve you, I'm ready to love you. And if that is the standard, if I don't like the way you dress, if I don't like the way you play an instrument, if I don't like, none of the other things matter, right? If the standard is command me, I'm ready to become a slave and receive a command. So in order to do this, church, to submit to one another, we need to become the same love that we have received in Jesus. All of the activities in which we are to be filled by the, by the Spirit, now speaking, singing, giving thanks to God, and submitting to one another, the one that requires the more care of living, the more, the more wisdom, the most redeeming of time, the most emphasis on the will of the Lord, and the one that, uses the, that, that God uses the most to fill us with his spirit is submission to one another. Because mission, submission encapsulates the command of Jesus to love one another as he loved us. And by submitting to one another, we are putting into action what he told, taught us to pray. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But the truth is that we have become ex experts in practicing modern Western church, but we're not very interested in practicing first century love. And it is very sad because I'm there too. I'm very interested in all of this, but I'm not as interested in becoming a person of love that the people who announced the kingdom when it exploded were like. And I am convicted even right now of that. But the answer to bring heaven on earth is not more events, is not more churches, is not more things to do. It is to become a person of love. Because that is the way Jesus loved us. He submitted himself to the point of death for us because he loved us first and to do this we first have to live a life that is constantly is be being filled by the holy spirit that's number one and number two the second thing is that we need to be trained in this way it doesn't come naturally again it's a new way of speaking singing being thankful and submitting to one another and that is be being filled by the holy spirit we need to leave the communication patterns of our family of origin, leave our culture's view on singing, view on speaking, view of success, view of everything. And we have to be reparented into this new family that reflects a whole set of new cultures. And that takes redeeming time, it takes intentionality, and it takes community. So, this is the time. If we truly want to bring heaven to earth, if we truly want to live the love that Jesus lived, not as a worn out cliche or a kumbaya moment on a Sunday morning, but as a true worship filled everyday lifestyle, countercultural to this earth and to this age. Church, if we truly want to see this world be a more Eden like place, we must submit to one another in reverence to the one who submitted to us first in the person of Jesus. Loving like Jesus is the ultimate measure of success for a disciple. And I pray that it becomes your ultimate goal and my ultimate goal in life. That our main labor in this world is to redeem the time, to be wise, to know the will of the Lord, and to become people of love. Let's pray. God, there's so much that you want to teach us. There's so much I would like to say. There's so much I would like to know how to say better. But God, you know what this world is aching for is your love. You became flesh to show us your chesed love, your agape love, your love that is loyal, that is present, that is unfailing, faithful, that is sacrifices himself for us. So God, I pray that today we can be the people who say, no more living for this age. No more living for the things that others live for in my community. I want to live for the age to come. And I want to be a light for you wherever I am. And God, I thank you that there are evidences of that already here today. There are evidences in 
people that don't know each other, don't know each other's language, each other's language, coming together under the banner of Jesus Christ. And God, out of reverence to you, may we decide to be being filled by the Holy Spirit in order to reflect the love that you showed us in Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.